Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight to celebrate The Detective and the Spy, the new novel from Angela Misery and Cormorant Books. I'm Alex Snyder, one of the co-owners of Queen Books and an independent community bookstore in Toronto's East End. We've been open for just about three and a half years. And in that time, we've had the good fortune of, fortune of hosting several events with Angela, from launches to kids writing workshops. She reached out to collaborate with us in our very early days, and it meant so much to have an author so generously offer their time and support when we were so brand new. We couldn't be more excited for The Detective and The Spy, published by one of our absolute favorite indie presses, Cormorant Books, uh, a match made in heaven, uh, or be any happier to be a part of its launch. So Queen Books does have a lot of copies available, um, all of which Angela has already autographed. The books are available in our brick and mortar shop as well as on our through our online store for both delivery and um, curbside pickup. So thank you again for joining us tonight and I'm going to pass the mic, so to speak, to Barry. Barry Jowett has been acquiring and editing fiction and nonfiction for nearly 25 years, managing imprints that have focused on crime fiction, literary fiction, and children's literature. He has worked with authors on books that have won or been nominated for major awards such as the Arthur Ellis Awards, the Edgar Awards, the Governor General's Literary Awards, the Amazon First Novel Award, the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, and Provincial and National Children's Awards. He joined Cormoran Books in 2009, working with numerous adult and children's writers. Right. Off to you, Barry. I, uh, thank you, Alex, and thank you to Queen Books for hosting this launch. Normally, we'd be doing the launch at the store, and we hope to be back there soon. It's a great space uh, for events and a great store for anyone who loves books. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't been there, when you can, please go and check them out. Uh, Queen Books, uh, as Alex mentioned, they've only been around for a few years, but they've been a big part of their neighborhood and a favorite bookstore in Toronto and a huge part of the, the book community. Uh, we thank them for their support of our books and of books in general. Uh, Queen is one of the many independent independent booksellers who found themselves unable to open their doors to welcome you in this year. So they found a way to get books to you. And I want to encourage everybody to uh, order books from Queen if you're in their shipping area. If you're not, order from your local independent bookseller. Uh, it might be convenient to order from the big online retailer that sells you clothes and electronics and farm equipment. Well, I don't know what you buy there, but uh, rather than giving our money to people who have been making a profit off a pandemic so that they can you know, put lunar landers on the moon, uh, let's support independent retailers who are like the rest of us. We're all just trying to get through this and uh, it's been a struggle for a lot of independents, so help them out um, and you're going to feel good about yourself. And I'll remind you that there are holidays coming up that involve gift buying. Uh, think of all those people on your shopping list. You could order five, six copies of Detective and the Spy tonight. Uh, and think of all the names you cross off your list. Um, the book is, of course, by Angela Misery, um, who's, uh, I've worked with her on three books now. Uh, she's a versatile writer and a creative writer. And you can tell from reading her books that she enjoys the worlds uh, that she creates and the characters she's creating. And this book, she's brought in characters and settings that we know from Arthur Conan Doyle's work, but they're guests in the story of Portia Adams rather than the other way around. This book and the world of this book are Angela's creation and uh, the book revolves around a compelling character who is never overshadowed by the literary, literary inspirations. Uh, a little bit about Angela. Angela Misery is the author of the Portia Adams adventure series and several essays on Sherlock Holmes. Her middle grade novel, Pickles vs. the Zombies, is a Hackmatack Children's Choice Book Award finalist and was shortlisted for the 2021 Manitoba Young Readers Choice Awards on the Sundogs list. Her next middle grade book, which I just sent to typesetting this morning, is Trip of the Dead. It's set in the Pickles vs. the Zombies universe and will be out early next year. If you've got kids on your shopping list, they would love Pickles vs. the Zombies because they... Uh, I, Cat, a house cat fighting zombies, what kid doesn't love that? Um, and joining Angela tonight will be Terry Fallis. Terry is the award-winning author of seven national best-selling novels, including his latest book, Albatross, uh, all of which are published by McClelland, McClelland and Stewart. Uh, the Best Laid Plans was the winner of the Leacock Medal for Humor in 2008 and CBC Canada Reads in 2011. The High Road, 
was a Leacock Medal finalist in 2011. Up and Down was the winner of the 2013 Ontario Library Association Evergreen Award and a finalist for the 2013 Leacock Medal. The Leacock people really like Terry's work. If you read his work, you'll know it's, it's, there's, it's great humor. Uh, his fourth novel, No Relation, won the 2015 Leacock Medal. And his fifth book, Pulls Apart, was a finalist for the 2016 Leacock Medal. Uh, One Brother Shy became an instant bestseller. And his seventh novel, which I believe came out last year, uh, was a number one national bestseller a week after it was published and remained on the bestseller list for months. In 2013, the Canadian Booksellers Association named Terry Fallis the winner of the 2013 Libris Award. Uh, on behalf of everyone at Cormorant, I want to congratulate Angela on her new book, and uh, I'll turn things over to her and Terry now. Well, thanks, Barry, and uh, thanks for that very kind introduction. But enough about me. This is Angela's <laughs> night. Congra congratulations. This is, a, this is a great thrill. I'm so, uh, I'm so happy for you. This, this book is wonderful. It, it's a great read. It pushed all of my buttons and ticked all of my boxes. Uh, so nicely done, and congratulations on your, uh, the fourth in the Portia Adam series, your book birthday today. Thank you so much, Terry. This has been a long time coming, and I'm pretty excited to be talking about it tonight. Excellent. Well, look, we're going to talk for, I think we said four or five hours, and then we'll yeah, have right. 20, 20 minutes for questions, and then we'll probably, you know, close it down. No, we're going to talk for about half an hour, uh, and... We're not going to spend all that time talking about the new novel because it's hard to do that for any length of time without giving away spoilers and, and your audience, your loyal audience, all of your fans, they don't want us to reveal what's, uh, what's going to happen in this novel. They want to discover that for themselves and having just experienced that myself, I understand that, that sentiment. But we will set up the novel a little later on. Uh, but those of you who are watching in the, in the hundreds, I'm sure, uh, if you have questions for Angela, we, we do have some time at the end of our chat uh, for questions. Uh, so uh, write them in the chat box, if you would, and I'll try and scan it as we, uh, as we get closer to that time. And we'll ask some of those questions uh, to Angela. Only the good ones though, Terry, right? Yeah, well, I, I will ones. be, I'll be picking and choosing. Uh, I like so. it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Angela, you and I have a couple of things in common, probably more things, frankly, but at least two that I can think of for tonight. One is that we're both writers, but the other is that we both love Sherlock Holmes. Uh, in fact, we are uh, both members of the Bootmakers of Toronto, the official Sherlock Holmes Society, uh, and that sort of reflects our shared interest. But I'm sure that readers of your novels would like to know, if they don't know already, how you came to Conan Doyle's creation and what the, the home stories, the canon, as we call it, has meant to you? Well, I'm a daughter of immigrants. And quite frankly, when we were growing up, my dad and I would read stories together, like he would read stories to me at bedtime. And this was one of the stories that he would read. He would read through the canon because he grew up in India and Conan Doyle was very popular in India as well. It was translated into many languages, um, the original canon. So it was kind of like a bonding experience. My dad introduced me to Conan Doyle and, um, what I mean, I was, you know, introduced to some fascinating stories at a very young age. And so I was super lucky about that. And it triggered a lifelong um, adoration of mystery novels. I, I went from Conan Doyle to Nancy Drew to Hardy Boys to Ag Agatha Christie to, you know, all the way down the line. Um, I read a lot of mysteries over my uh, young life, um, but I would say prompted by my dad. Well, isn't that great? Uh, I came to it a bit later uh, in life, but once I, I found Holmes, I was probably in my 20s by the time I, I read my first story, oh. uh, and I just fell under his spell. And his, I mean, people don't talk that much about his writing. They're sort of locked into the stories and the plots mm -hmm. and how interesting and exciting they are. But to me, he crafts a really fine sentence, Conan Doyle does, and I just, I love his sentences. So uh, There's beauty. There's beauty in the prose, absolutely. There, there really is. So, uh, so I think I know the answer to the next question, but did your love of writing and your decision to write novels, uh, that clearly happened after you came to Sherlock Holmes, but maybe it provided you an obvious outlet uh, to start your writing? I guess so. I mean, I knew that I liked to write stories that were about curiosity because I was a madly curious child and probably prompted by the what I read. I, I've always believed this, that you do, you write best at what you read. Like, and I read mysteries like crazy. Um, so 
I don't know that I wanted to be a writer, or at least that I had, you know, articulated in my mind that I wanted to be a writer. I was an Asian child who came from parents who came from India. So basically, I was supposed to be an engineer or a doctor. That Those were my options. I was never really given <laughs> other options. The first time I really thought about having other options was due to my grade eight teacher. So my grade eight teacher had submitted a poem of mine that I had written for a class assignment. And without me, without my knowledge, she had submitted this poem and it had been accepted by this anthology in Alberta. And it had been printed, like somebody had published my poem as one of, I don't know how many other poems, but it got printed in an anthology. And that was the first moment I was 13 years old that I actually thought, wait a minute, people do this for a living? Non-doctors do this for a living? Like, I didn't know you could do this. So I brought it home to my parents and I was like, I can't believe this. I'm going to be a writer. It turns out I'm a writer. I'm not a doctor. And my dad was like, oh, that's cute. Uh, you could be a doctor who writes books. You could write books about medical textbooks. That's a good combo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can understand that. And nice that you said that we can make a living as a writer. That's, that's very optimistic of you. <laughs> yes, exactly. I like that. I like that. Uh, um, maybe an unfair question to ask of a, of a Sherlock Holmes fan, but do you have a favorite story and and why does that one in particular appeal to you so much um i have a couple of favorite stories it is an unfair question terry and you knew that yeah, i know i i know i realize that <laughs> i think i know what your answer is going to be by the way but let, i'll see let's let, we'll let so, it play out i'm a big fan of irene adler even though she doesn't spend a lot of time actually on the page despite what you might think from hollywood she actually spends very little time in the actual canon i think she's only in for I don't know, 120 words in the entire thing or something. It's tiny. Right. Um, so Irene Adler is one of my favorites, which means Scandal in Bohemia is one of my favorite stories. But I also really like the Copper Beaches. That's one of my favorite mm -hmm. stories. I just was fascinated by the idea by Violet, who is um, one of the main characters in this story. Uh, she's basically um, commandeered into playing someone as a role and she doesn't know why and she can't figure out why for the longest time. So she goes to Sherlock Holmes and to Watson. I always found that story really fascinating. I usually figure out what's going on in a mystery before the end of the story, like at, a, at an appropriate time. I couldn't figure this one out for the longest time. It was right. great. It was totally surprising. Yeah, that Copper Beaches is, is, is wonderful. That's one of my favorites. My other two favorites are uh, the Musgrave Ritual. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I love yeah. that one, probably because I'm an engineer by academic training. So there's a lot that. of, there, there's math and there's geometry, Euclidean geometry in the Musgrave Ritual, which uh, is central to the solution. Uh, right. So I love that one. And I, I've always liked the Blue Carbuncle too. Uh, oh sort yeah, of a with nice the goose? Christmas yeah. story with the goose. The goose yeah. Yes, that's a good but one anyway. too. Okay, well, that's, that's great. Now, um, I have always been a member in good standing of the Write What You Know School of Writing. I'm assuming, given what you write about, that you have one foot in that camp, at least, uh, as well. Uh, are, is your writing process, well, tell us a bit about your writing process for those uh, writers who may be watching. I, I think writers are always interested in how other writers write. It's true. Um, so for the Porsche stories, I'm actually more of a pantser. I know uh, there are pantsers and there are planners. I am not a planner. I'm sorry to say that if I'm disappointing anyone. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know uh, who's going to be the bad guy at the beginning of a book. I, I just know what I want Portia to discover and I want what I want her to travel. The distance I want her to travel as a character is basically what I focus on. I didn't actually realize until I finished the first book how much the characters were basically all people in my life. Uh, Portia is very much me. Um, Annie, her best friend, is very much my sister. Jason, my husband, is very much Brian. So there's a lot of, you pull from your life, you pull from people around you. And the bad guys are also pulled from people in my life, though I'm not going to tell you who they are. Um, <laughs> so it, it's very much uh, pulling from uh, your, write what you know, which is, I write about a Canadian girl who inherited 221 Baker Street at the age of 19. And that's, that's something I love to think about. Like, I love to think about myself <laughs> inheriting 221 Baker Street at the age of 19. That's a great place to put yourself and to write from. So yes, I very much believe in writing what you know and writing what's around you and making sure your characters feel like real people by pulling in the real people. Right, and I, I'm totally with you. I think it's so much easier to write with, with authenticity if you're writing about something that either you know about or you're passionate about, and that just comes through in, this story. 
that you're that you tell uh, in the detective and the spy. Uh, you can tell that the person who wrote this is uh, is a lover of uh, of that period and of that world, the, the world of of Portia Adams, but with yeah. overlaps into the into the the Holmesian uh, universe uh, as well. And and speaking of that, it you know. It's one thing to know a thing or two about England in the 1930s. It's another to capture it as vividly and accurately and authentically as you have in all of the Portia Adams uh, novels, uh, but in particular this one, since we're talking about it tonight. How have you done that? How have you gone through that research? I mean, I know in the story, Holmes uh, has, uh, of course, inherits some some material from from Watson and Holmes that she uses a map of of London that has all sorts of you know the street names on it and it's very useful for for her. But what did you use to research 1930s London and be able to bring it to life so vividly? Well, I think like you, I do as much research as I can beforehand to get myself in the frame of mind to be writing about it. So I have like copious notes about 1930s London and 1930s Canada because the story starts in, in 1930s Toronto. Um, so lots of notes, lots of books, lots of time in libraries. I also have a, an amazing group of beta readers who are really good about capturing things that I'm missing. We are part of the bootmakers who know more about Sherlock than either of us will ever be able to amass, like that group of humans. Um, are able to give me so much feedback on this stuff. But I've been lucky. Uh, my first book came out and I remember somebody contacted me and let me know that the lace I described in one of the scenes had not been invented yet. Like it literally did not exist by the 1930s. And I was, I was astounded. I was just like, how would I even check that? Like who even knows this right. stuff? The woman who actually wrote to me works at the Smithsonian in the fashion department. And she, wow. like, of course she knows, like she absolutely <laughs> knows. So she reads everything I write about fashion now, like anything, any scene that I write, I send her away. I've done my research, but I need her as my beta reader. So it's a combination of research, having the right people reading it over, but I am in no way perfect. Let me just say that, Terry, I've definitely made mistakes in, in every novel I've written, I'm quite sure. Um, but I also have amazing editors like Barry who call me on things, even if they, they're not sure I'm right or they're right, they'll call me on it and be like, where did you, how do you know this? Um, which is really useful. I'm also a journalist, so, um, and I work at the Walrus, and we're all about the fact checking. So uh, it's, I do a lot of fact checking on my own, and I do a lot of um, like capturing and footnoting, and I'll be able to refer to it. If somebody asks me, how did you refer to that lace, for example, I did write back to that woman and say, look, it's from this. And she's like, oh, that is not a reputable place to get your information from. From now on, go here. So I footnote wow. everything, I can chase everything down. Yeah. Isn't that great? So it sounds like your experience as a journalist has been integral to your ability to research your own novels. It gives you a maybe a more jaundiced eye, a more objective <laughs> view of of, uh, of the data that you are uh, gathering. Uh, is that fair to say? Like journalism Holmes, I'm been only, part of it. I'm only as good as my data, just like Holmes. I need the data, and if I don't have it, I'm not confident about it, and I won't make I won't make jumping uh, um, assumptions based on it. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the bootmakers, and and uh, I'm not. I am a member, but I'm sort of a. I, I I'm not a real member. I haven't really gone to any <laughs> meetings except for one I, I spoke at once. And but I sort of have honorary membership for which I am eternally grateful. But you do you did mention the bootmakers and yeah. the Sherlockians, if that's one way of describing them, uh, who populate that that organization. Uh, you know, there are so many echoes of Holmes in in your novels, you know, where she lit, where Portia lives, uh, her family, her detection and deduction techniques. Let's just say Portia Adams is a, is a chip off the old block. <laughs> but I think you would agree that some Sherlockians are, they're really protective. They jealously oh, yeah. guard the legacy of, of Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle and, and the canon. And uh, they don't always take kindly to those, the yeah. imitators who are writing about yeah. that world. Uh, how, I mean, were you concerned about how the purists might react to, uh, to uh, your work? And has there been any feedback or backlash or kudos? <laughs> I was terrified. I was absolutely <laughs> terrified. Because I'm, I'm also a massive fan, right? I'm, I'm just as terrified of getting it wrong as disappointing other people in getting it wrong. Um, so Portia is an interpretation of 221 Baker Street. She's not Arthur Conan Doyle's 
um, creation. She is, she's an interpretation. She's my, she's my interpretation. Um, but most of the feedback I have to say, I hope this doesn't change tonight, tonight, but uh, most <laughs> of the feedback has been very positive. People are really excited to see a Canadian woman in Baker street. Um, most people think that I've treated Holmes and Watson very fairly and very kindly, which I try to, because basically they're like my uncles and that's what I think of them as. So people have been very supportive and very helpful, even if they're critical and they say this didn't happen or you need to do this better or um, there's a scene here which could have been this. They're always in, in, they're always looking to make it better. I don't think they're trying to hurt my feelings or being, you know, mean about it. I think they're, they're just trying to make it better. And Sherlockians are amazing. I love them. They're the best. I miss them so well, much in this pandemic. Oh, yeah. Well, well, you are probably the best person, uh, as far as Sherlockians are concerned, to write a novel like this, because you clearly are one who has demonstrated your respect, your reverence for the, the canon and for the characters uh, themselves. So I, I'm not surprised that it's been positive. Plus, when you read the novels, uh, if you have a bit of background in Sherlock Holmes, you can see how carefully and reverentially you you conduct yourself in that world. So, uh, I hope so. so. I'm, Thank you for I'm, saying that, Terry. I'm not surprised that there hasn't been, uh, you know, there are no no death threats coming your way or <laughs> no <laughs> or or flaming emails. Not yet. Um, <laughs> just before we uh, we dive into the detective and the spy, as unbelievable as it sounds, it's remotely possible that not everybody online tonight has read uh, any or all of the preceding <gasps> Portia Adams stories. I know an egregious Shocking. oversight to be sure, Shocking. and I'm sure yeah. they wouldn't admit it, but, <laughs> but maybe for, for those who might be online and are being introduced to you, uh, right. haven't read the others, uh, and you've touched on it already, but, but introduce us to Portia Adams and her, her journey and how she is connected to these other worlds we've been talking about tonight. So in an attempt not to be too spoilery, I will try yes, to tell you guys of course. the first one. So the first three Portia books um, I wrote in, in 2013 and 2014, and they were published by Piercing Crest, which is no longer around, but were fabulous humans and were very good to me. Um, Portia is a 19-year-old Canadian girl in 1929 when she loses her mother to cancer. And it's, it's losing her mother to cancer and the, at the reading of her mother's will that she finds out she's inherited this townhouse in London that she's never heard about. She lives in Toronto. She's never been outside of Toronto. Her parents are very, they're not even middle class. They wouldn't even call themselves middle class. She lost her father in the Great War. Um, so she's an orphan sitting here with a will that tells her she's uh, inherited a townhouse in London, England, somewhere she's never been. Um, and suddenly a woman shows up and she's her new guardian. She's 19, but she has a guardian. This is a very confusing situation, but there's nothing in Toronto here holding her here. She's an orphan. So she takes off with this uh, older lady who takes her to London to introduce her to her new life. And that's when she discovers that she inherited 221 Baker Street from Dr. Watson, which is not any more clarifying. It's still really confusing and she has no idea what's going on. So she spends the first book trying to figure out what in God's name is happening, who were her parents, who is Dr. Watson and how is he related to her? She'd of course heard of Sherlock Holmes, as had everyone at that point. Um, but that's what the first book is about. The second book is about kind of exploring this idea of being a con consulting detective. Is that something she would wanna do? Would she wanna run as far away from that as possible because she's a woman and she's 19 and she's Canadian and she's sitting in London. Um, and then by the third book, she's pretty much embraced it. She's, she's become the consulting detective from Baker Street. She's taken over those big shoes and that big pipe. And uh, that's what the third book is about. So yeah, those are the first three books. By the time you get to The Detective and The Spy, we, we actually um, took a few years off between the third Porsche book and the fourth Porsche book, both in times in, in real time, like here, uh, but also uh, in Porsche's life. She's 25 by the time um, this book starts and she's well established as the detective at Baker Street. So I hope that doesn't give away too much. Barry will probably tell me if it is. <laughs> No, I think that's great. So, so with that as as the context, can you can you set up the detective and the spy again without giving any spoilers yeah. away, uh, and uh, just so people understand what they're heading into. So, at the beginning of the detective and the spy, you've got Portia established as the detective at Baker Street. She is being consulted by Scotland Yard. She's working closely with her partner, um, who's the Watson in this situation. It's Brian's Constable Brian. 
her best friend Annie, who is a reporter and has been in two of the stories so far, is also so instead of Watson, I replaced um, that, you know, the sidekick kind of person, the, the best friend with two best friends. So she has Annie and she has Brian. Um, so she's well established. She's feeling at home. She's really comfortable. And then in the first chapter, she gets blown up. She gets blown up and everything gets set back to zero. So she has to restart everything. She's losing her ability to participate as a detective. She's lost her hearing. She can't communicate. Um, and she's reset to zero. And if that isn't bad enough, she's also suspected as the bomber. So she goes on the run. Um, and that's how the story starts. So it's, it's an interesting take on Portia's life that, that, uh, that is not going to be surprising to anyone who's a writer that I've completely disrupted her life right off the top. Um, but it was important for me to have Portia understand her place in the world and how easy it is to lose that and how um, hard it is to strike to, to, to get back to where you were and everything you lose on that journey and everything you gain. So that was kind of the right. point of this story. Well, it, it is great. And uh, you've already mentioned uh, about her being blown up. And in fact, uh, I li limited my questions here to the scope of what is written on the back of the novel, because anybody who picks up the novel uh, can see that. So I don't consider those spoilers. But <laughs> so there are bombs in London in this uh, in, in this story. Uh, yeah. And were you it's sort of intentionally mirroring the more modern day panic in the streets of London that has happened on several occasions in the last you know, 10 years. It's been the site of, of several terrorist attacks. Were you conscious of those parallels and was that part of your, your plan? Unfortunately, yeah, that was part of it um, that I wanted to, it was kind of like a, a harken back to um, both what was happening in real life there and what would happen in the Second World War, which is coming up on them, right? It's 1935 in this book, uh, but also what is happening now, the, the civil unrest and the, the violence that has plagued London and other big cities. Um, and the idea that, that there's a mobilization effort on the part of police officers and everyone who works on that side to try to shut this down. And that may result in innocent people being accused, being uh, under, under fire. So yeah, all of that was in there and, and very much um, um, something I was aiming for is to reflect that real life feeling. Right, well, it, it, I think it does help connect with readers that, because they immediately sort of make those little, uh, they see those parallels and those connections with modern life. And sometimes when you're writing a, a period piece, you're actually writing about the current day uh, yeah. as well. So I thought okay. that was uh, very clever and, and skillful. Um, the other thing you did that was, I thought, really creative and totally reshapes the story is, uh, and again, this is written on the back of the book, so not a spoiler, but you rob her of her powers of communications, which is something that she obviously uh, needs in her detective work. Uh, but not only can she not here, but the words that are coming out of her mouth are not uh, the words that she intends. Yeah. Where did you come up with that? And that was a great obstacle to throw in Portia's path. Um, I both wanted to give her something that she had to deal with in present time, like something unexpected that she would have to fight back against, but also something that many people deal with. Many, many people deal with disabilities of all kinds that are both identified and not identified and, and visual and not visual. So I wanted to give her both those things, the ability, the loss of her ability to hear things and the loss of her ability to actually communicate things. Like thing, words are coming out of her mouth, but they're not the words she means. That can be incredibly frustrating, I'm sure for anyone. Anyone who has dyslexia can speak to the fact that reading something and, and saying something and all of those things, these are just things that happen to humans. Um, and I, I wanted to give her something that she would have a lot of trouble fighting back against and also feel was super unfair when it wasn't. It isn't unfair, it's, it, it happens. It happens to anyone um, and to some people it's their entire lives. So I knew I wanted to take away two of her, two of her things that she relies on. And um, she, I'm not going to uh, spoiler uh, as to how she comes out of this or, or wh what she walks out of the book with, but I will say she is forever changed. This is not the same Portia that walks out of this book that walked into this book with that confidence, that swagger. It's a different woman who walks out. Right. Well, that's, uh, I thought you handled that uh, really well. Um, I know we're just launching this book right now, but is your, has your mind turned to another Portia Adams story or am I pushing? 
<laughs> oh my God, so much trouble, Terry. You're so much trouble. Um, I already know the title of the next book. It's called To Kill a King. And uh, it's, a, it's about Mackenzie King. So Portia's coming back to Canada. That's what I know about this book. I've, I've started to like have ideas about it, started to like come up with the, the crimes that are going to lead her here. But um, it's kind of, it's, it's in the works in my head, but it's not on the paper. Well, that's great. And, and you, that's okay, you know Mary. about, <laughs> you know about Mackenzie King's uh, interest in the occult and I do. seances and his- Very I Arthur think, Conan Doyle. Yes, and his yes. his dog it was a very important part of his life too. So all of that, Pat. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm sure you will. Yes, Pat, his dog Pat, <laughs> uh, his I'm senior reading, advisor. <laughs> I'm actually reading Unbuttoned. Have you read that bi I, biography? I was going to say I have it on my shelf right here. Yeah, it's uh, it's very good. I liked it. It's really good. Yeah, I'm I enjoying liked it, it a lot. Okay, so um, I have sort of exhausted my my questions. I'm not not completely, but. Uh, we went through those faster than I thought looking at the time. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you a, another, another Sherlock question that I'm sure is asked of, of most fans of Sherlock. Who is your favorite uh, cinematic or TV Sherlock Ooh. character? I mean, I have a very, I'm very much, a, a, I know who I love, but who do okay, you think Okay, who do you is... love? No, wait, I wanna hear who you love first. <laughs> oh, well, to me they're, and, I don't know if this is going to pose a challenge for our friendship, Angela, but I, <laughs> I'm a Jerry, Jeremy Brett man Jeremy from Brett. beginning to end. Got uh, it. No exceptions. Well, I mean, oh. they're all very good, but I think Jeremy Brett to me is Sherlock Holmes. That is, you know what? I, I have something to admit to you. I've never seen a Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes. I have never seen one. No. no. I have never seen one. I've seen pieces of them on YouTube from what people have sent to me, but I've never start to finish seeing a Jeremy Brett. And I obviously need to. Oh um, my goodness, you, you I must. Know. I have I the whole, I have the whole box set of DVDs. You do? Uh, <laughs> oh my God. I do, I do. They <laughs> so are, I think he's great. I'm betraying my age here, but I'm gonna say Cumberbatch is my, uh, my Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, well, he's pretty good too. He's, he's pretty, pretty good, good too. Yeah. But what you'll find about Brett, and there may be people listening or watching who have seen it and can appreciate it, but his little mannerisms are, are I mean, it's just brilliant acting in my mind. And his little smirks and the little noises he makes, it just, <laughs> I just think he, he lifts uh, the prose right off the page. And they often use oh. prose dialogue right from the canon in those uh, in those stories i really need so. to watch i know <laughs> <laughs> i think uh, i i think you i think you should um <laughs> so uh, have you got other books that you're that you're working on as well in the other i know you contribute to anthologies quite often about homes yeah. and you've written about the scandal in bohemia which is why i thought that might be among your favorite yeah. stories uh but uh, do you have how many projects do you have on the go right now um, I'm writing something about Laura Secord right now, interestingly, which is a super fun research um, thing that I'm doing. So that's been fun. And uh, I've got the third Pickles book. So Barry just let right. us know that he's he's working on Trip, which is the second book. The third book is called Val Hamster because it's about a hamster who fights zombies, obviously. Um, naturally. Yeah, naturally. Uh, so that's, the, that's about halfway done. So, uh, you know, always several things in the air, just like you, several things in the air. Exactly. Um, well, that's great. Look, I've really enjoyed this. I've learned a lot about uh, how you approach things from our discussion. Um, so that's been really useful. Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, it may be a bit premature, but we've been speaking for well close to half an hour because we started earlier than, than I thought we would. Uh, so why don't I try and, and bring some of these questions in and let's see. Okay. Um, so here's the first one is, my kids are young what books would you recommend to introduce kids to detective fiction? That is a great question. There are some young Sherlock Holmes stories that I would highly recommend um, that I love. Uh, I would also recommend some, uh, I mean, the Nancy Drews, your old Nancy Drews are definitely accessible to babies, basically anyone over the age of six. Um, so I would highly recommend those. I don't think I'd recommend Agatha Christie yet. Uh, ooh, um, Kevin Sylvester writes a fun mystery series. It's uh, yes, I've forgotten the name. name. It's a, it's uh, a cook, right? Yes, it is. He's a chef. Yes, yes, he's a chef. That is an awesome series from Kevin Sylvester that I would highly recommend for kids. 
Um, Neil Flambe, thank you, Joyce. Yes, that's Neil it. Flambe. Perfect. Yes, that's it. Thank that's God exactly. we have an educated audience. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what have you ever heard of Encyclopedia Brown? Mm. My kid loves Encyclopedia Brown. I never got into it, but my kid just adores it. Yeah, and yeah. they're quite they're quite old. I mean, I oh, very I was, old. Yeah, I think when I was a kid, they were, which is a long time ago. <laughs> I was reading them. The other one I remember from my, uh, you know, adolescence and and younger was uh, uh, they were called the Three Investigators. Um, oh, writing uh, and, it down. I've never heard of that one. Well, I don't even know if you can still find them, but I hmm. think they were actually called Alfred Hitchcock's Three Investigators. I don't know why Hitchcock got in there because he's got nothing to do with the stories, but it's these three. <laughs> Of course, it's a product of its of its time. It's three young guys uh, yeah. who live in in one of the guys' family's junkyard. They, their headquarters is in a a, an, a trailer that's buried in junk. Oh it's their secret headquarters. I mean, it's 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 awesome. That's brilliant. Anyway, brilliant. so the three investigators, if if they're still around, three investigators. They, I really enjoyed them. Okay. Okay. Uh, here's one from Joe Mahoney, whom I know to be a writer uh, as well. Uh, I think it's the same Joe Mahoney who came to our, our book club, in fact. Uh, do you have a favorite Sherlock Holmes related movie? Uh, I guess the R RDG ones, uh, RDJ ones uh, would be my favorites. Again, I haven't seen a lot of Sherlock Holmes. Oh, Enola Holmes. That's a great movie. Oh, Just yeah. saw it. Kick That's that new. was a great movie. Yeah. Okay, good. So, I haven't Holmes. seen that. But You'll it's funny, it. when I'm watching the uh, the Robert Downey Jr. Uh, mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes, or even other ones that have happened, I, you know, I don't really even, I try not to think of it as Sherlock Holmes, because if you if you view it through the Sherlock Holmes, a Holmesian right. lens, a Sher Sherlockiana lens, uh, you may be left unsatisfied. So just consider it to be a great story. Yeah. It is uh, a great story. It's hilarious. Yeah. It's very funny. Yeah. Yeah. I, and... Plus my, my good friend, Stephen Fry star, not my good friend. I wish you were my good friend. I, I'm a big Stephen Fry fan and he, Me too. I believe he stars as Mycroft in, uh, that's right. in, in one of them, but in uh, the second one. okay. Yeah. Yes. So that's a good one. Okay. Here's one from Jennifer. Sherlock Holmes is such a legendary character and brand. Is it tough to please the community of fans? Hmm. That's a, I gotta a play say, on an earlier story. <laughs> in my experience, no. In my experience, the fans are incredibly giving and incredibly open. As long as you are respectful of the characters they love, which I am because I love them as much as they do, uh, it seems to go okay, knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can see that that's true. If you are respectful, uh, they will be. I guess there are some real purists who don't think that anyone should touch it. That yep. the canon exists in this you know, this antiseptic vacuum uh, and nobody should go near it and touch it. Otherwise you're, you know, diminishing the respect that surrounds it. But I, I don't agree with that, but I'm sure there are a few like that. But in general, yeah. if you treat the characters um, with respect as you clearly have, I imagine yeah. if you turned him into something other than, or referred to him in other ways, that, that might arouse some ire, but, uh, so I think you're on the right track. <laughs> okay, so. from Mark, how did you arrive? This is a good question. How did you arrive on the name Portia Adams? That's a great name, by the way. Thank you. Um, so what happened is I knew what her first name was going to be because my favorite Shakespeare is uh, the Venice one. Um, Merchant of Venice? Merchant of Venice. And <laughs> Portia is in that story. And I always thought right. Portia was a great name from that story. And I liked her as a character. I thought she was quite powerful. Um, so Portia was always going to be her first name. Constance Adams is one of the suspected wives between the Marys of Watson. And so that's where the last name came from. So Portia Constance Adams. Well, that's great. So good little insight there that we wouldn't really know. Uh, yeah. We didn't have the author with us. That's great. <laughs> Okay, here's one from our friend Sarah Cooper, Cooper, who works at Cormorant, and she says she's a reader. What's it like to translate the Holmes universe into a female perspective, something that has been sadly lacking until you've come along? Um, it's been it's been done before, quite frankly. Like if you've read The Beekeeper's Apprentice, uh, there's there's right. Laurie R. King has done a great job of bringing some female perspective into the Holmes world. So I didn't feel like I was alone there. Uh, but I just brought my own point of view. Like, I literally just dream about owning Baker Street and just being 19 and running through the streets. And like, that is, 
something I dream about all the time. So it isn't hard for me to locate myself uh, and know how I would feel in, in those situations as an outsider. So um, like I said, it's been done before, it's been done well. Uh, I just wanna uh, you know, contribute to the female perspective sitting inside of Baker Street. One of the things that I did think about actually very specifically was the kind of cases Portia would take on that Holmes would have nothing to do with. So Holmes was very specific about the type of stories he was interested in. Watson would bring him all kinds of stuff. Lestrade would bring him all kinds of stuff. And it was always like, well, do I wanna do that? Is that actually interesting to me? Portia's thing is that she will find things that are interesting to her that wouldn't be interesting to Holmes. And that was really important to me. So she takes on right. cases um, for prostitutes, like because it, it's, in, it's in her gender and she encounters these women and, and it's more like something that she would take on than he would. So I do think very carefully about would Holmes take this on? If Holmes would take it on, then let Holmes take it on. She's gonna take on something right. she would take on. That that's a really great insight. Uh, I'm I'm glad you mentioned it because, you know, it is the home stories are very male oriented. Yeah. They are a product of their time, yep. uh, and this is a really nice uh, balance to that. By the way, Howard Gibbons uh, has just noted in the chat room that there. I was right. It's, ah, it's Alfred Hitchcock books. and the Three Investigators. There are forty-four books. I don't think I read near that many, but mind you, they go till 1987 and I would have been quite old by then. But <laughs> now, now I feel really bad about only being on book four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Four books. Wow. Well, thank you, Howard, for that. That's, I'm glad yes. to know that. I really enjoyed them. And who knows if they stand, I mean, I, seriously, I read them when I was 12 and 13, so I don't even right. know if they stand up, but, uh, right. but I remember just, uh, well, not revealing too much, but I was a member of the Leaside Amateur Private Investigators when I was growing up. We started our own uh, PI agency as as kids, uh, oh, probably nice. fueled by Hardy Boys and the yes. Investigators. But yes. Anyway. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Joyce Grant. Angela, how do you build a mystery that the reader can't guess right away, but which they can guess later on by connecting the clues? Ah, a very... An age-old yeah. question to mystery writers. Question. You know, it's really interesting because uh, I didn't discover this in myself until I had editors. Like until you actually have somebody else reading your book, you don't really know uh, if you've nailed it. I'm actually really good at figuring out the crime and who the bad guy is and getting all the clues in place. I'm not really great about telling you enough to figure it out. I figured it out. Writer, of course, she's creating the world. She's figured it out. But I remember the first time I sent something to an editor they they pointed out like these are extrapolations and these are jumps and I don't understand how you got from this to this and they're in my head they're just not on the page so I think a lot about the steps it takes and the leaps that Portia must make and the leaps that you must make as a reader um, the leaps you make as a reader are smaller and they're wider they go along um, more of the story and Portia must leap faster and uh, more more consistently so I do think about that a lot I also think a lot about red herrings. I love red herrings. I love throwing all kinds of red herrings at people. It's like my favorite thing to do. I love to convince someone that they figured out who the bad guy is and then just take it all away from them. It's like my favorite exactly. thing to do. <laughs> um, and sometimes as you, when you read through a draft or your editors do, uh, does it ever happen that you think, okay, I haven't given them enough here. I need to yeah. drop a little something into chapter three or five uh, so that they can connect those dots later on. That's absolutely true. Like I don't, I've never nailed it in, in, a, in a draft that went to an editor where they got it all the way through. I usually have a, a point at which they're like, okay, you need a scene here or something because you've made this leap and nobody knows how you've done it. And I'm like, yeah, the scene was in my head. You're right, that needs to be on the page. Right. Um, I'm usually the person that delivers less words and then has to write more by the end of it. Uh, I'll write like okay. 70,000 words and then people will be like, we need another 10. And I'll be like, oh my God, when am I going to do another 10? <laughs> Right. Um, so and where I'm do just, I put them? Yeah, where do I put them? I'm a journalist. I'm used to brevity. I do it quick and right. dirty and, and write. Uh, and then all this description. Oh my gosh, my, my editors are constantly asking me for more description. <laughs> exactly. yeah. uh, okay, um, we got one from Stephanie. I'm wondering how you balance novel writing on top of your work as a journalist. When do you write? Ah, this is a very good question. So yes. I write... I write fiction in the mornings and nonfiction at night. That's how I do it. Um, so all, not, uh, all fiction is written before 9 a.m. Uh, hmm. So I, I write between like six and nine, I write fiction. And you can do research in there. It doesn't have to be pure writing. Journalism I do during the daylight hours. 
uh, I find that the the fact the fact based nonfiction I write during the day. Maybe that's just right. because of what pays me. <laughs> yeah, well, journalism actually pays for me to do the stuff. So yeah, <laughs> it, it's certainly a relevant question to almost any writer because, yeah. uh, as you and I will both know, and and the other writers who are joining us. Um, it's really hard for someone in Canada to live by their fiction writing uh, alone. It's really hard, but. I'm told okay. it's 10 books. 10 books is when you can live off of it. Are you at 10 books yet, Terry? No, I'm just, uh, my eight is just in with eight. the publisher now, but uh, I. You're two books away. Yeah, but I, I really, I can't see That's how that, that 10 book <laughs> rule works based on what I know about eight books. <laughs> 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 anyway. Um, Another question. What about a screenplay? Movie deals? Uh, have there been any any interest and who would play Portia in your mind? Uh, I have written a screenplay with the help of the Canadian Film Centre. Um, I won a contest about three years ago and I was part of um, basically a team of three who got to write to take their um, intellectual whatever property and make right. that into a screenplay. So the Can Canadian Film Center has helped me write my first screenplay, which was amazing. And I would suggest it to anyone. It's a great process. Um, so it got optioned by E1 and then dropped. So I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. We'll see. Uh, I mean, I have no idea. These things happen all the time, as you know. They get optioned. Things oh, happen. yeah. Yeah. Yes. If, if you think being optioned is, uh, being optioned just means that there's a 99% chance that it won't happen <laughs> instead of 100%. That's <laughs> That's generally what I've come to understand. I believe it. I believe it. Okay, so that's good. That's, uh, that's helpful. So what message would you share with young readers and writers, reluctant ones too, about getting started as a young author? What would I share as getting started? I would say just finish. I mean, I think that's a good rule for everybody. I have so many people that I meet in my life, both kids and adults, who have stories in them and they're like, I just want to write this book. And I say, write the book, finish the book. Don't just talk about it. Don't just try to sell people on it. Don't pitch it. Don't like do all the things that you do beforehand. Just bloody write it, get it all down, get your first draft down. Cause there's 10 other drafts after that. So get it all down <laughs> right. on paper. Like it's, it's really important. Um, so that would be my advice. Finish, finish a story, like actually get it all down. Right. I think that's good yeah. advice. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, do you have a discipline schedule for writing daily or how do you, well, we sort of touched on that one already, yeah. I guess, before, before <laughs> yep. nine o'clock for, for fiction. Yep. All right. Um, what would you say to your younger self if you had the opportunity to meet them yourself <laughs> today? Oh. Interesting, Interesting question. What would I say to my younger self? I would say worry less, like worry less about what people think of it, worry less about I mean, if we're speaking specifically about writing, um, right. there's a long time that you spend in your teens and your 20s thinking you're not good enough. And the truth is that I first read, I, I don't think we talked about this, I first read Stephen King's take on Sherlock Holmes uh, when mm -hmm. I was like 15 or 16, and it's called The Doctor's Case. And it's a great short story. If, if you haven't read it, I suggest you, you go find it. It's in one of his big, you know, um, short story uh, anthologies. And it's a great story. And I remember reading it and thinking, well, if Stephen King can write about Sherlock Holmes, I can write about Sherlock Holmes. And I don't know what made me think that that was obvious, like, <laughs> that Sherlock, <laughs> that this was totally doable then. But I remember that being a moment and it took me another five or six years to actually get up the, the juice to, to write my first full novel. And I was probably 21 when I wrote my first novel. Um, and it's sitting on a shelf over there and I literally haven't opened it since I was 21 because it's either the best thing I've ever written or the absolute worst and I just don't want to know either way. <laughs> I'm good. It's over there. So if I die, there's a book over there, people. <laughs> well, look, what I take from that is uh, start young. Don't don't wait if you're yes. if you're interested in writing. I, I was 45 mm. when I wrote my first novel and it's been one, wow. been one of my great regrets. Uh, so I'm trying to make up for lost time. So <laughs> if you have a love of writing and, and a desire to do it, uh, put the words on the page. Uh, don't wait. Absolutely. Definitely. Get it done. Um, on that happy note, I think we have exhausted uh, the questions. Oh, hang on. Oh, nope. one more. One okay. more. It's, it's about, it's almost, we're getting up to seven o'clock, which is when we promised we would release the hordes from this. <laughs> uh, as another question from Joe Mahoney. 
great advice to finish the story, but how do you do that in less than 20 years? <laughs> what tricks do you employ to keep going to the end? You know, one of the secret tricks I have is I sign contracts and then Barry and other people chase me for the end of the story. So there's one <laughs> is, is actually you owe someone something because they've given you money. Uh, that's one. But if that is not something you can do uh, right off the bat, then I would say switch gears. Like I have four stories on the go or three or four stories on the go because there are days that Portia does not want to speak to me. She's off doing whatever she's doing. So I switch to Pickles or I switch to Laura Secord or I switch to whatever else in journalism I'm writing. So right. Uh, I don't make myself feel bad, especially during pandemic times. If I'm not churning out 5,000 words a day, I just switch gears. I'm okay. I'm going to go do this for a while. I'm going to read that biography of uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King so that I can write Laura Secord. Like give right. yourself, like be kind to yourself and, and switch gears. That would be my suggestion. That That's good advice. And I always talk about uh, the twin pillars of discipline and desire. Uh, you really need both. You have to, you have to have a love to, for writing. You have to really want to do it. And yep. then that's got to be coupled with the discipline to actually put your ass in the chair, forgive my language, because uh, no, it, it isn't going to write itself. <laughs> so It really doesn't. The house elves. We need the house elves, but they're just not showing up. So it's us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, Angela, this has been really fun. I've learned a lot having read the book already, but I've just learned a lot it's always nice to hear from the author to get the insights that you can only get from the author. So uh, I'm thrilled for you with uh, the launch of the, tech, the, the Detective and the Spy, the fourth in the Portia Adams uh, series. Everyone should run right out to their independent bookstore right now and order it. And as Barry rightly pointed out, Christmas is coming. So why not buy five or six and, and you're done? Uh, so thank you. I, I've I really enjoyed this. And uh, now I'm going to ask... Alex to come on back and I think she's going to take us home. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, thank you so much to everyone who, who joined us tonight for this great conversation. Um, I also learned a lot and made me want to go back and, and reread some Sherlock Holmes as well as Angela's other books. Um, and we're just so happy to welcome the detective and the spy into the world. So thank you, Angela and Terry. Um, and to Barry and Cormorant, and a big thank you to Chantel Cho, Cho and Sarah Cooper from Cormorant for the technical expertise. Um, and bravo, bravo again, Angela, on the new book. Um, please, if you can, buy a copy or two from your favorite bookseller. Um, the holidays are just around the corner. And um, doesn't everybody have a mystery lover on their gift list? Um, so thank you again to everyone for a delightful evening. Take care. Can I just... Can I just say thank you yeah. to everyone as well, Alex and Terry and everyone and Barry and Cormorant and everyone who's been so good to me. Thank you so much for coming tonight and thank you for so much for always supporting Portia. I am, I am, I will never be able to pay you all back for your kindness, but I will buy all your books. So <laughs> thank you very much and thanks for showing up guys. Thanks everyone. <laughs>